Um, and I think with imaging experiments, with more controls, I think one can get at this. Is there a difference for short-term exposure to have inside therapy versus interpersonal therapy or cognitive therapy that vary in a fairly systematic way in the degree of insight they provide? In psychotherapy, does the, the, the psychotherapist uh, effect some change in the brain of the person yes. who is undergoing psychotherapy? Yes, absolutely. We should be able to document that. Well, what changes? Anatomical changes. I mean, insofar as therapy works and behavior in the patient persists over time, I presume you should be able to see this anatomically. And there's beginning evidence for this. Uh, the Baxter Group at University of California in Los Angeles has studied obsessive compulsive neurosis and has shown that there's a certain metabolic abnormality associated with it. With psychotherapy, that is reversed, just as it is reversed with pharmacotherapy. That's quite wonderful. If one can show this in a variety of circumstances, I think they would go a long way toward showing the efficacy of psychotherapy. Yeah, there's a tendency now that uh, you need drugs to treat mental disorders well, because may. talking cures would not change anything. I don't believe that. I think drugs are very important, but often talking cures can substitute for drugs, and even more often they can work together. Very beneficial way. What are the, the what you call the moments of meaning in psychotherapy? It means that in a therapeutic experience, not every change occurs as a result of insight. Many things occur the patient is unaware of. And that is the therapist will respond in a gracious, accepting way to things that the patient will say. Instead of being punitive or threatening, he will be accepting. Um, he will be supportive of the patient. Those are things that you communicate with gesture, with the tone of your voice, with the facial expression. They're not communicated as insights. They're not related to your childhood, to your, const your current romantic or business relationships. So these are nonverbal unconscious communication that nonetheless give the patient a feeling of confidence, of support, of trust that allows the therapeutic procedure to move on. Okay, but in the end, uh, the goal of psychoanalysis of any therapy maybe is that the person will really get an insight into the self. No. Is that really possible? Yes, it's possible, but that's not the only goal. The goal is to make the patient function better. And I think increasingly one feels that some of those changes in function are not simply related to insight. They're due to the fact that the patient has an opportunity to re-experience certain traumatic or painful or awkward or embarrassing events in a trusting, comfortable relationship. You said in your Nobel uh, acceptance lecture that uh, the most exciting thing for you was to work in a lab. I like very much the book. Yeah, what is exciting about, uh, for instance, uh, you, you worked with this uh, sea slug, uh, a prisoner, right? Yes. Um, and uh, for many years you were devoted to studying this. I still spend a lot of time in a place here. Yeah. It's fantastically interesting to be able to take a complex problem like learning and memory and see how a snail oh. learns a simple task uh, and to see what goes on in the brain is just a privilege. Um, and I find it very exciting to show up every day and talk to people, uh, talk to my friends on the phone. Um, you know, for most people who enjoy science, it's like a game. You're like a child all the time. You find out how things work. Uh, you can take them apart. You put them together again. Occasionally, you make an interesting discovery. Um, it's a very privileged life being a university professor in doing science. A very privileged life. One other thing that excites you is this new technology of imaging, uh, brain imaging. Yes. So uh, it's going to be possible, uh, as you wrote, that, uh, for instance, you can test if a, psych a psychotherapy is efficient. Yes, I don't see why not. Uh -huh. yes. Uh, what, what, what will happen? Uh, you're going to see what? Well, we image you and we see, for example, that you are too modest, right? <laughs> Your superego is too large. But we find out which structures are involved in superego function. You, we take you into treatment, we shrink the superego a little bit, and we see whether or not this produced anatomical changes. I mean, I don't think this is so far-fetched. I mean, I think over 20 or 30 years, one could really make progress here. There was a recent film 
uh, it was more of a joke that it would be possible to erase certain memories. For instance, the memory of a certain person that you broke up with, and then you, you probably saw that film. No, no, no I don't go to the movies very much. Eternal yeah. Sunshine of the, well, I forgot the title. <laughs> My memory is not that right. good. So uh, is that going to be possible, to eliminate certain memories? That's a very controversial issue. But I don't think the function of psychotherapy is to eliminate memories. If anything, it's to expose memories that have been sort of pushed into the background. Um, you know, I think life is a rich series of experiences, and insofar as it's possible, there are limitations. It is important for people to come to grips with their experiences and to incorporate it into their character structure. You learn from your disappointments, your defeats, um, your errors mm -hmm. in a very important way, and we should not try to push those aside. Um, so I'm a strong believer in um, trying to handle one's memories effectively. Now, obviously, you don't want to spend the whole day thinking about the fact that you were just turned down for a date by somebody that you called up or that you're disappointed in some way. I think a healthy personality knows how to devote most of one's time to the effective and good and happy things that are occurring and to pay less attention to the things that are disappointing and frustrating. I saw how in the University of Pennsylvania, they are doing brain imaging of monks and Buddhists in meditation. And they claim that uh, you can see uh, the relationship with God in the brain. It is wonderful, the nature of mystical experience, religious experience. Um, and I'm not religious. I mean, I'm Jewish, and I occasionally go to synagogue. But uh, I'm not a deep believer. But I must tell you that when I go to synagogue, and I participate, I love the chanting of the synagogue. I, I feel very good about it. I realize it's a completely mystical experience. Um, it's sort of a cultural bonding as well as some communication with some unknown higher source. Um, so I can understand that there would be brain changes associated with it. And people who meditate claim, and I fully believe that, that it's beneficial for them, that it's relaxing. And many physicians recommend relaxation therapy of various kinds to patients. To the millions of people who suffer from mental disorders like depression and other things, what is the hope uh, right now? Look, when I started in psychiatry in 1960, there was no treatment for schizophrenia. It was just emerging. The treatments for schizophrenia and depression and anxiety states were just beginning. Go back 10 years, 1950, zero. So in 50 years, psychiatry has moved from being the most ineffective treatment modality in all of medicine to being moderately successful. I mean, we're pretty good with depression. We can really handle depression pretty well. Um, Schizophrenia, we treat some aspects of the disease well. The most important, we don't treat well. Anxiety states, we can be helpful with. Uh, we have a better idea of what are the limitations of psychotherapy. We, there are quite good evidence that certain short-term problems of psychotherapy are very helpful. Uh, either alone or in conjunction with um, antidepressants and depression. Um, so I think we've made a lot of progress. So I think I'm very hopeful for the efficacy of psychiatric treatment in the future. I think psychiatry is on a good trajectory. Isn't it amazing that, uh, uh, going back to the slug, uh, that uh, such simple animals, the, 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 not the mental, but uh, the, the process of, uh, the neural process is the so same conserved. as in our brain. But this is one of the great lessons of all of biology. This is from Darwin on, from 1860, we've appreciated that evolutionary processes are conserved. A snail has fear. It has to escape from predators. It has to move away from dangerous situations. You and I have fear systems. You know, if we see somebody pointing a gun at us, we move away. If somebody's about to hit us, we move away. If we uh, learn that food is bad, we avoid it. So we have built in a series of mechanisms that you can find already in snails. So there are certain conserved evolutionary processes. 
people have shown over and over again that the molecular mechanisms underlying that conservation is also conserved. The behavioral conservation is conserved. I think that's wonderful, and it's no longer astonishing. It was astonishing when it first emerged um, that um, you see the same kinds of gene regulators in simple animals and complex animals, and in both cases, they're involved in stabilizing behavior over the long term. I think it's quite remarkable. This is what has made molecular biology so powerful. But you know, the ethologists, the famous students of behavior in Europe, pointed out in the 1920s, 1930s, that you can study complex behavior in simple animals because they share in elementary form and much reduced form many components of complex behavior. You have four grandchildren. Are they in awe of their grandfather getting the Nobel Prize? We like each other a great deal. And there's a wonderful picture of my two older grandchildren and me, I don't know, a half an hour after I got the Nobel Prize. You get the Nobel Prize not by yourself. So it's a group of people and you go in order. So by the time the ceremony's over, they hopped onto the stage and the three of us are standing together with this wonderful medal and we're just having a great time. Okay, thank you. Thank you.